Good morning. In today's headlines, a battle over what constitutes free speech as former President Trump's lawyers and prosecutors square off over a protective order in the D.C. case. Meanwhile, the judge in the Mar-a-Lago documents case is raising some concerns about procedure. An appeals court blocks another Biden student debt relief measure. This one aims to help defrauded students. We have the details. The White House is exploring new ways to strengthen cybersecurity in schools. Find out what it's doing to combat a rising number of cyber attacks on U.S. schools. Texas is in the news with a new Women's Sports Act signed by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. Meanwhile, Riley Gaines describes a harrowing scene at the bill's signing. Two doctors are suing the medical board in California over the state's mandatory implicit bias training. We hear from a lawyer in the case. And does birth control put you in a bad mood? We speak to an expert about the effects it can have. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Tuesday, August 8th. And it seems like Biden is taking another step in his broad efforts to relieve students of their debt um, debt loads. Yeah, and advocates of this program say that it stops backlogs so students who were swindled can get the relief they need in a timely manner. Right, and on the other hand, there is the groups filing the suit allege that sometimes these students don't actually have to show injury to get um, to get compensated. Right, well, we'll see where this goes. But first, we're starting off with our top news, an update on former President Donald Trump. His lawyers say they're fighting to protect his free speech rights ahead of his 2020 election trial. They urged a federal judge yesterday to reject a protective order sought by prosecutors. And today's Daniel Monahan has the latest on Trump's legal issues. Prosecutors argue Trump could improperly share confidential evidence before trial. In a filing late on Monday, U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin ordered the two sides to meet Tuesday. She says they have to agree on two possible dates for a hearing to be held no later than Friday on the matter. Trump's attorneys acknowledge that some court documents should be shielded from the public, but say the need to protect that information doesn't require a blanket gag order over all government documents, saying, In a trial about First Amendment rights, the government seeks to restrict First Amendment rights. Prosecutors say Trump's attorneys have discussed the case on major U.S. television networks since they asked for the protective order and believe the former president plans to try the case in the media. Trump lawyer John Loro says he will seek to transfer Trump's election case from Washington, D.C. to West Virginia, while Trump is calling for Judge Chutkin to recuse herself from the case. Hans von Spakovsky, senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation, agrees with critics of Chutkin that Trump will have a hard time getting a fair trial. He points to what he calls very harsh sentences Chutkin has given to January 6th defendants and the fact that she was a partner in the same law firm where Hunter Biden worked for several years. Some of the statements also that she has made when sentencing the January 6th um, defendants, I think, raise serious questions about uh, her potential bias in this case. Von Spakovsky also takes issue with the alleged co-conspirators being lawyers who gave advice to Trump. That is a clear violation of the rules governing uh, lawyers and communications with their clients. Clients like uh, Donald Trump are entitled to rely on what uh, their lawyers are telling them. In related news, a lawyer connected to Trump's efforts to challenge the 2020 presidential election results, John Eastman, is requesting that a California judge delay disbarment proceedings against him. Trump pleaded not guilty last week to federal charges that he conspired to try to overturn his 2020 election loss to Democratic President Joe Biden. It was the third criminal case brought against Trump so far this year. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The federal judge in former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago documents case speaking up about some of her concerns. She is questioning why the Justice Department is using a D.C. grand jury in the case. Judge Eileen Cannon sits on U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida, and she presides over former President Trump's Mar-a-Lago documents case. In an order on Monday, the judge highlighted special counsel Jack Smith's use of a D.C. grand jury to lay additional charges against Trump. 
Cannon asked the Justice Department to address the legal propriety of using an out-of-district grand jury proceeding to continue to investigate and or to seek post-indictment hearings on matters pertinent to the instant indicted matter in this district. Trump was indicted earlier this year with 37 counts in Cannon's district. The D.C. grand jury led to three additional charges against Trump in the documents case. Cannon imposed the deadline of August 22nd for the government to respond. The available pool of jurors in D.C., a Democrat stronghold, is considered largely hostile to Trump. This raises concerns of whether the special counsel is grand jury shopping. A legal expert told the Epic Times that such a practice is unusual, but not necessarily unconstitutional. Kurt Levy, an attorney who is president of the Committee for Justice, a conservative legal advocacy nonprofit, said he was not aware of any federal statute that forbids the practice. But he added, quote, typically the grand jury is in the same federal district where the case is going to be tried. House Judiciary Chair Jim Jordan is accusing an FBI agent of lying under oath. He says the agent made false statements in his deposition last year about Hunter Biden's laptop. A transcript of FBI Special Agent Elvis Chan's deposition shows he testified that he had no internal knowledge of the Bureau's investigation and suppression of the laptop story, and that he only became aware the agency had the laptop in its possession from media reports. Chan testified in November last year on the FBI's efforts to suppress news of the laptop as it spread across social media platforms before the 2020 election. He testified that he was not a party to any meeting with social media companies where the laptop was discussed. Aside from a preliminary briefing, the task force gave to Facebook on the subject on October 14th in 2020. That was the same day the New York Post broke the Hunter Biden laptop story. Chan also testified he wasn't aware of any other communication between Facebook and the FBI about the laptop. Jordan says internal Facebook documents show Chan's statements were completely false. The congressman shared an excerpt from those, part, from those parts of the documents on his ex account. He referenced an interaction mentioned in the Facebook files between a Facebook employee, a former FBI agent, and Chan a day after the initial briefing. Jordan is accusing the Justice Department of stonewalling his committee's efforts to interview Chan. He promised the committee will not be blocked in its search for answers. An appeals court blocking another Biden student debt relief measure yesterday. The Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals halted a rule that aimed to help defraud its students. Biden's rule would have made it easier for people defrauded by their schools to have loans forgiven. The rule changed the grounds for borrower relief and set up new ways for the Department of Education to review claims. It also allowed the agency to provide relief to entire groups from one school. Career colleges and schools of Texas brought the lawsuit, calling the rule unlawful and unconstitutional. The three-judge panel on the appeals court granted their request for an emergency injunction, but gave no explanation. An appeal will be heard in November. The White House is scrambling to respond to a rising number of cyber attacks on schools across the U.S. The administration is hosting a summit today for discussions on how to bolster security. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on the Cybersecurity Summit. Teachers, school administrators, and private companies will take part in the summit hosted by First Lady Jill Biden, Education Secretary Miguel Cardona, and Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas. According to the White House, at least eight K-12 school districts across the U.S. were targeted by significant cyber attacks during the last school year. Four of these attacks caused schools to either cancel classes or shut down entirely. The White House says students and employees' sensitive personal information was stolen and publicly disclosed. Information including medical records, student grades, behavioral information, documented home issues, and financial information. The White House officials also say the school's security system's information was leaked online as a result of the attacks. Monetary damages varied between $50,000 and $1 million. A report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office found the loss of learning following a cyber attack ranged from three days to three weeks, with recovery time estimated to take between two and nine months. The Biden administration has stepped up efforts to strengthen national cybersecurity this year. It unveiled a plan at the end of last month to increase the accessibility and affordability of cyber training with the goal of improving the cyber workforce. The new initiatives come as autocratic countries like China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran jeopardize U.S. national security and economic prosperity by aggressively deploying cyber capabilities. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. 
Two doctors are suing the Medical Board of California over the state's mandatory implicit bias training. We hear from a lawyer in the case. Did you know ESG is impacting every part of your life? From rising gas prices to global food shortages to out of control inflation, even losing your freedom of speech and being censored on the internet. It's all being driven by ESG ideology. Who's in control? What can you do about it? Find out in The Shadow State, the first documentary exposing ESG. The ESG movement of governments and corporations operates in the shadows. Only the light of truth can expose it. Watch The Shadow State documentary, streaming now. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Imagine a coffee that cares for your health. Expertly fermented with a 50 enzyme complex to enhance flavor and remove bitterness. Small batch roasted to a decadent medium dark, resulting in a brew that is gentle on digestion, low acid, and up to 90% less caffeine than regular coffee. Try America's first enzyme fermented coffee today. It's all is good, it, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. The last of the four Minneapolis police officers connected to the 2020 death of George Floyd was sentenced to prison yesterday. Former Minneapolis police officer Tu Tao was sentenced to nearly five years in prison. Judge Kale said that Tao, based on his training, was aware of the restraint he witnessed grossly deviated from the standard of care, was extremely dangerous, and risked Floyd's death. Tao was found guilty of aiding and abetting second-degree manslaughter in May. Throughout the entire process, Tao was, has maintained his innocence. He rejected a plea deal with a shorter sentence. His lawyer said they plan to appeal. Two doctors are suing the Medical Board of California over a state law that forces physicians to undergo regular mandatory so-called implicit bias training. Entities Jack Bradley spoke with Caleb Trotter, an attorney with the Pacific Legal Foundation, which filed the lawsuit. Caleb, welcome to the show. It's so great to have you on. Thank you, Jack. I want to ask you about California's uh, Assembly Bill 241 and its impact on physicians. Yes, thank you. So the, the law was passed by the legislature a couple years ago now in, in 2019. It started to take effect last year, though, and over the last 12 months, uh, physicians and, and in particular instructors of continuing medical education have begun to feel the effects. Uh, the law requires that all instructors of continuing medical education courses, these are the courses that um, all physicians and surgeons are required to take every two years to maintain their licenses. Uh, well, now as part of those requirements, every single course with very few exceptions must include training on what's called implicit bias. This is the, the idea that um, everyone may have inherent biases on the basis of all any number of immutable characteristics, including race, um, that everyone has some of these biases and they're unconscious and they might cause you to act on them unconsciously. And so now um, as a matter of taking all of those courses, uh, each one has to include instruction on that topic. And why was it important, uh, according to the California legislature, to include this in those courses? Well, I guess we'd, we'd have to ask them, but I guess if we you know, assume the best is that um, 
let's just assume the existence of implicit bias, that it might lead to disparate uh, treatment outcomes for patients, and that if they can make all physicians aware of this and um, teach them how to address it, then maybe they can prevent any of these um, unfortunate uh, uh, um, any of these disparate treatment outcomes for patients. The, but there are several problems with, with that idea. One is that uh, the existence and the prevalence of implicit bias, particularly in the healthcare industry, is controversial at best. There's mixed evidence on its prevalence. Um, there's mixed evidence um, whether it even leads to disparate outcomes. And, and worse, there's evidence that just that these trainings alone can lead to, uh, to negative results. They can, for example, cause resentment amongst all the physicians that are taking these courses. They can even lead to distrust from their patients because af after all, if, if the starting point for these trainings is that every single doctor is inherently biased against someone for some reason, then why should you trust the physician? So if you're someone who, um, a, an instructor who disagrees with the evidence, because like I said, the evidence of these problems it is mixed and it's controversial. You can't really just, you know, disclaim that, you know, I'm only providing this message because the state requires me to by having to give these strategies or examples. It's really forcing you to 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 provide the, the favored viewpoint and message of the government. And when the First Amendment applies, as it would in a situation like this, this is the type of situation where the government is held to the highest burden to prove that uh, that, that kind of requirement should be constitutional. And of, of course, we don't think that they can meet that burden. Any final thoughts for our audience? I, I think as, as we've seen with various efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion, even the instances where there's evidence to support these you know, well-meaning efforts, uh, Typically what we see in states like California is they take a step too far. In this case, California has gone especially too far in um, assuming a problem exists while there's mi only mixed evidence to support it. But in spite of that, taking such a heavy hand um, in requiring inclusion of something that's only supported with mixed evidence in, in a very important field, which is medicine, and imposing this on all of our physicians and surgeons while they might be making a, a problem um, all, all of their own making. And um, this is a problem that um, I, I applaud our clients, two doctors, for taking a stand as uh, an unpopular stance, perhaps, in medicine, but they are um, standing up for what they believe to be right and actually supported by evidence. And we believe that the First Amendment is on their side, and, and we, we hope a court will see it similarly. Caleb Trotter with the Pacific Legal Foundation, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jack. Up next, the U.S. has a new round of tanks ready for Ukraine. That's as Russia continues to attack the nation with drones and shells. And where should U.S. weapons go? An expert says many arms sent to Ukraine are urgently needed in the Indo-Pacific to deter China from invading Taiwan. We hear his solution on how to protect both effectively. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. Anyone who's ever sold a home can tell you it is really hard. That's why who you work with matters. Together with Homelight, we've helped thousands of people sell faster and for the best price. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Pre-diabetes does. With early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the one-minute pre-diabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. Good to have you back. More weapons for Ukraine. Washington is set to soon send a new round of tanks to Kyiv. This comes as Russia is launching a series of attacks in Ukraine. And today, Sam Wong has more. 
The U.S. military has finished refurbishing the first run of M1A1 tanks for Ukraine, and the first shipment will be going to Europe, where the U.S. Army is training Ukrainians to use them. The tanks could arrive in Ukraine this fall. They're also sending items such as ammunition and other spare parts. In Russia, President Vladimir Putin told head of a state-owned defense conglomerate to ramp up drones production. Producers promised me that they would increase the amount of production. They are keeping up with these promises, but we need to increase production even more. Putin added that domestic drone manufacturers will eventually take over the nation's market once foreign companies leave Russia. And the crossfire in Ukraine continues. Two Russian missile strikes hit several residential buildings in the eastern Ukrainian city of Pokrovsk, leaving five dead, four civilians and one emergency service responder. 31 people were also injured. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky released footage showing apartment blocks in ruins with smoke billowing over the rubble. Many on the scene are spotted rescuing those who are trapped underneath. First responders are seen rushing an injured person into an ambulance. Zelensky vowed to stop what he called the Russian terror. Pokorovsk wasn't the only city attacked by Russia in the last 24 hours. A woman was killed earlier on Monday when Russian forces shelled the southern Ukrainian city of Kherson, while two others were killed in the Kharkiv region, a border area in northeast Ukraine. Both areas are near the front line. In recent days, Kyiv's military has reported increased Russian attacks in the Kharkiv region. Sam Wang, NTD News. Does U.S. aid to Ukraine help Taiwan? The question comes after the U.S. sent cluster munitions to Ukraine and had just announced about a third of a billion dollars for a weapons package to Taiwan. We look closely at this issue of how the U.S. can use its funds most effectively to further its security interests abroad with an expert. Please welcome Alex Velez-Green, a senior advisor to the Vice President for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Alex, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Hey, very much likewise. Thanks so much for having me. How would prioritizing Ukraine aid threaten deterrence by denial in the Indo-Pacific? Sure. It's one of the most important questions in Washington today. Bottom line, uh, we are not nearly as well positioned as we need to be to be able to deter China from invading Taiwan. And that needs to be our focus. So when we think about Ukraine aid, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, is what we're sending to Ukraine helping or hurting our ability to do that? Unfortunately, so far, we've sent a lot of weapons to Ukraine and other things that are required in the Indo-Pacific to deter China. And that's something that we really, really need to correct quickly if we are going to be able to prevent war in the Pacific. So in your view, how will the $41 billion that the United States has sent to Ukraine in terms of security assistance thus far have on Beijing's ambitions towards Taiwan in either outcome of the Ukraine war? Sure. Well, when we think about deterring China, the most important thing we can do is convince Xi Jinping and his lieutenants that they won't be able to successfully invade Taiwan. That is kind of the, the, the gold standard for deterrence. Doing that requires us to strengthen U.S. and Taiwanese defensive positions in the Indo-Pacific. That is ultimately what is going to decide this one way or the other. Whether Ukraine wins or loses, if we are not strong enough to prevent invasion, then Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping is much more likely to try it to actually invade Taiwan and potentially succeed. So, you know, when we think about what we're sending to Ukraine and how that's impacted our ability to strengthen our defensive positions in the Pacific, you have to look at a lot of the weapons. Many of the things sent to Ukraine, frankly, are not terribly useful in the Pacific, so that's less concerning. But many of the things we have sent are very, very, very much uh, important for strengthening, particularly Taiwan's defenses. You think about air and missile defenses, long-range fires, anti-tank weapons. There's a long list of things that have gone to Ukraine, uh, frankly, depleting our own stockpiles of what we can now send to Taiwan. Um, and that meaningfully impacts our ability to get those weapons to Taiwan as quickly as possible to help deter China. Well, Alex, that is concerning, considering that recent war game simulations show that the United States would run out of these long-range missile capabilities within a few days, actually, if Taiwan was being invaded by China. What is the difference between deterrence by denial and deterrence by punishment in terms of China's ambitions? A absolutely. So it's basically deterrence comes in two forms. One is deterrence by punishment, right, which is basically you're going to tell somebody, if you do this, I'm going to make it so costly that you're not going to want to, and so, so that will theoretically deter them in the first place. Deterrence by denial is different. Deterrence by denial says, if you try this, you will fail, regardless of how much it costs. And it may well be very costly, but the, the punchline is you're just not going to be able to succeed. Uh, when we think about China and Taiwan, deterrence by denial is, again, sort of the gold standard. The Trump administration embraced it. The Biden administration has embraced it. Um, and for good reason. When you look at Xi Jinping's behavior, when you look at the Chinese state's behavior, 
all signs suggest that they are prepared to absorb very, very, very high costs in order to seize control of Taiwan by force if necessary. You see that in the incredible sums that they've spent on military modernization, including during the pandemic. Um, you see that in efforts underway now to sanction-proof the, the Chinese economy. These are all very costly efforts, and they all suggest that, that they will, frankly, be willing to bear even higher costs in the event of a war if they think they can see, successfully invade Taiwan. So our task is to convince them that they can't. And Alex, briefly, before we go here, what is the solution? How can the United States further its interest by protecting Ukraine while also deterring China from invading Taiwan? Absolutely. First and foremost, we've got to prioritize deterrence in the Indo-Pacific. If Taiwan needs it, if U.S. forces need it in the Pacific, they've got to get it. They've got to get it as quickly as possible. And as we do that, we can figure out, well, what are the things that, frankly, aren't needed in the Pacific? And those are things that we can feel much more comfortable sending to help Ukraine. Very sensible analysis here. Alex Velez Green, Senior Advisor to the Vice President for National Security and Foreign Policy at the Heritage Foundation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And now some short headlines from around the world. A senior U.S. official traveled to Niger yesterday and held talks with the country's military leaders following last month's coup. Acting Deputy Secretary of State Victoria Nuland said there was no progress in meetings that she described as difficult. Washington offered ways to restore democratic order, but Nuland said the junta officials showed little interest. The skipper of a motorboat involved in a crash that killed an American publisher last week in Italy was distracted by his phone. That's according to the husband of Adrian Vaughn, president of Bloomsbury USA. Italian media reported that the suspect also consumed alcohol and cocaine before ramming the bigger boat. Ukraine says it has arrested a woman over an alleged plot to kill the Ukrainian president. The alleged Russian informant was allegedly gathering intelligence on Zelensky's trip to southern Ukraine in July. The security service also says the woman collected data to identify the location of radio electronic warfare systems. Hundreds of firefighters are scrambling to put out a blaze raging in southern Portugal. The fire has scorched thousands of acres of land and forced the evacuation of around 1,400 people. It started on the Alentejo region, but has since spread south towards the Algarve, one of Portugal's top tourist destinations. And that crash in Italy is just another reminder that you got to put the device down when operating a vehicle. Good point. Let's keep that in mind. Yep. Coming up, Texas Governor Greg Abbott signs the Save Women's Sports Act. He was joined by former NCAA swimmer Riley Gaines, who describes a hectic scene at the bill signing ceremony. And a court decides that a college's policy on flyers hurt a student group. Find out more about the free speech violation after the break. Also, millions of Americans take to the skies this summer for a vacation. An experienced pilot-turned-novelist talks about how the industry has changed and provides some useful information. One in five children worldwide are faced with the reality of living without food. No family dinners, no special treats, no full bellies. All around the world, parents are struggling to feed their children. Toddlers are suffering from acute malnutrition, which stunts their growth. Kids are forced to drop out of school so they can help support their families. COVID, conflict, inflation, and climate have ignited the worst famine in our lifetime. And we're fed up. Fed up with the fact that hunger robs children of their childhood. Fed up with the lack of progress. Fed up with the injustice. Help us brighten the lives of children all over the world by visiting getfedupnow.org. For as little as $10 a month, you can join Save the Children as we support children and families in desperate need of our help. Now is the time to get fed up and give back. When you join the cause, Your $10 monthly donation can help communities in need of life-saving treatments and nutrients, prevent children from dropping out of school, support our work with communities and governments to help children go from short-term surviving to long-term thriving. 
And now, thanks to special government grants, every dollar you give before December 31st can multiply up to 10 times the impact. That means more food, water, medicine, and help for kids around the world. You'll also receive a free tote bag to share your support for children in need. Childhood without food is unimaginable. Get fed up. Call us now or visit getfedupnow.org today. It's good to have you back with us. Women's sports are in the spotlight. Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed a bill to protect them yesterday. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the Save Women's Sports Act. The bill signing ceremony took place at the Texas Women's Hall of Fame. The Save Women's Sports Act is now law in the state of Texas. <laughs> Abbott said he signed a law that protected K-12 girls sports two years ago, saying that protection is now expanded to the collegiate level. We're here because women's sports are threatened across the entire country. The governor was joined by former NCAA athlete Riley Gaines and others. Gaines described a tense scene on the way to the ceremony where girls as young as five were reportedly called vulgar names by protesters. There were bottles being thrown, there was spit in people's faces, profanities being yelled at children, but that will not deter us and that does not stop the celebration uh, of what we're celebrating today, which is a win for women's sports, it's a win for truth. Independent Women's Network chapter leader Michelle Evans shared on Twitter that she was physically assaulted and spit on after the signing of the bill. The Save Women's Sports Act prohibits men from competing in a college-level athletic competition designated for women. The stated intention is to maintain competitive fairness. It also enables people to get help from the courts if a Texas public college or university violates the act's provisions. The ACLU of Texas disagrees with the law, saying, trans students deserve to participate in the sports they love. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A win for conservative students in California. A court says a college did discriminate against the group's protesters, posters and flyers, I shall say. And today's David Lamb spoke with the students' lawyers for more insight. In a case about free speech and censorship in college, the Ninth Circuit Court denied a California community college's appeal on August 4th. Clovis Community College, located in Fresno, California, previously took down students' anti-communist flyers, so the students sued the school in 2022. I was really excited that the Ninth Circuit ruled in our favor. Uh, you know, it really struck down the, the arguments that the, the Clovis Community College made to defend its flyer policy. They basically said, we, we can take down whatever speech we want, if it's offensive, if it's inappropriate. Daniel Ortner's team represents Alejandro Flores, who was a student at Clovis Community College and part of the Young Americans for Freedom Club. In November 2021, Flores and other student members obtained approval to post anti-communist flyers from their conservative student organization to bulletin boards inside campus buildings. Clovis policy allowed the school to take down anything that was deemed inappropriate or offensive. When some students complained about the group's flyers, saying it made them uncomfortable, the school took action to remove the flyers. The problem is that the First Amendment protects offensive, inappropriate speech, you know, speech that some deem inappropriate. And it's really subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder what's inappropriate or not. And the government bureaucrats at Clovis can't step in and decide, we want to shut this down. We don't like this speech. They have to allow everyone's speech uh, under the First Amendment. And so you know, they can't choose, pick winners and losers about what speech is allowed or not allowed. And that's what we were able to you know, get the Ninth Circuit to once again reaffirm the importance of those First Amendment rights. At one point, the Clovis president told staff to take down the flyers, saying, quote, if you need a reason, you can let them know that we agreed that they aren't club announcements. So now we go back down to the, to the trial court, and we're going to keep fighting to hold these administrators uh, accountable for what they've done. They blatantly violated student speech rights, uh, and they shouldn't be able to get away with that. And Prosecutors want to make sure the school's policy is permanently removed and to seek financial damages for the students. NTD reached out to Clovis Community College for comment. In Santa Clara, California, David Lamb, NTD News. 
Millions of Americans are flying both domestically and internationally this summer. But what do we really know about commercial aircraft in the airline industry? NTD's Andrew Thomas spoke with an experienced pilot turned novelist to learn more. You know, American Airlines. Cam Maj was an airline pilot for 44 years. He spent 35 of them at American Airlines. After starting out as a flight engineer, he became a 777 captain. During his career, he piloted long-haul flights to places like Hawaii, London, Singapore, and Shanghai. The industry has endured a variety of difficulties over time, but he says 9-11 and COVID were the most significant. It lasted, you know, a long time, you know, a year and a half, two years for the airline industry. And it was pretty terrible. We had airplanes, um, we were flying with one passenger. You know, American Airlines, were, they were advertising they were losing $40 million per day. A lot has changed over the course of Maj's career. Aircraft that first operated using cables, pulleys, and hydraulics now use computer flight control systems known as fly-by-wire. Another change? More planes in the sky. Despite the increase in traffic, experts say flying is safer than ever. RVSM, four letters stands for, I think, reduced vertical separation minimums, is something that started in the, you know, over the Atlantic and worked its way into the United States. Uh, we used to have a 2,000-foot separation between aircraft. Now it's 1,000 feet. But many people are still scared. The main reason is turbulence. Flying through rough air can be terrifying, but Maj helps alleviate that fear with one fact. No aircraft, no uh, airline type aircraft, larger aircraft, has ever crashed due to turbulence. So just keeping that in mind has got to give a certain amount of you know, uh, comfort to people. He adds the key to getting over a fear of flying is good information. Maj cites statistics that confirm that air travel is much safer than some people think. You know, statistically, if you get in a car right now to go get a gallon of milk from around a corner, you have about a 1 into a 5,000 chance of getting killed in some kind of an accident. You get in an airplane, you got 1 in 11 million chance. After he retired, Maj decided to pursue a career in fiction. His latest novel, High Wire, depicts a female airline pilot confronted with a fly-by-wire computer virus. Can she save her passengers and her career? Andrew Thomas, NTD News. It is a good sign flights are packed nowadays. Oh yeah, that's right. I think he provided a lot of interesting information too. And I heard somebody say that um, those turbulences, you can just see them as little bumps in the road. Yes. But in air. Yeah, it's very reassuring. Mm. <laughs> All right, coming up, we have the latest finance news from business host Don Ma. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And also calling it quits after 13 years with Tesla. The company's CFO will leave his job at the end of the year, so stay tuned. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Prediabetes does. One in three adults has prediabetes, but with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute prediabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. Good to have you back. The CFO of Tesla has officially resigned. Zachary Kirkhorn says he will remain in the job until the end of the year to allow for a smooth transition. Kirkhorn began work at Tesla as a financial analyst in 2010 and was promoted to CFO in 2019. When he started with the company, it was worth around $50 billion. It's currently worth around $780 billion. 
Tesla has already named a new CFO. Neither Kirkhorn nor Tesla provided a reason for the departure. Yellow, one of the nation's oldest and largest trucking firms, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. That has put some 30,000 employees out of work. We bring in Don Ma, host of NTD Business, to tell us more. Great to have you with us, Don. Hey, Kevin. Good morning. How are you? Doing great. Yellow has just filed for Chapter 11, as we mentioned, Don. So can you give us the latest? So, yeah, Yellow Corp filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection, and this was on Sunday. And as you mentioned, the filing puts about 30,000 workers at risk of losing their jobs. Now, what contributed to its fall? Well, it was that it started taking on debt to buy many of its uh, unionized rivals, including a company called Roadway for nearly a billion dollars. Think about that in 2004. Uh, the company also had about $1.5 billion in long-term debt, uh, according to some, some financial reports. And nearly half of that debt came from a pandemic relief loan re received from the government in 2020. The trucking company actually blames the Teamsters for accelerating its demise. And its reason was that it, it accuses the Teamsters of opposing a restructuring plan. But of course, uh, the Teamsters Union denies that and responded that the company mismanaged the, the loan from the federal government, which was $700 million. Um, its shares plunged 30% on Monday. Think about that. That's huge, Kevin. Yeah, 99 years, that's a long run. But how will the largest trucking companies going bankrupt affect the economy? So Yellow Corp operates in the trucking sector known as less than truckload. But long story short, it's not going to have a material impact uh, on the economy. Now, less than truckload just means that moving pallet sized shipments. Um, of course, it's expected that this likely will actually benefit Yellow's competitors. Um, for example, like ABF Freight, Old Dominion Freight Line and T-Force Freight. There have been a number of reports on this, but according to the Wall Street Journal, various other truckers in Yellow's markets have seen anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 added shipments each day in recent weeks. ABF Freight, which is one of Yellow's main rivals, saw daily shipments surge at a double-digit pace starting in mid-July mid as um, shipping customers fled Yellow, of course. Now, Yellow's failure has a low risk of disrupting U.S. trucking markets because here's the thing, the, the industry has time, right, to work this out. And on, on top of that, most uh, U.S. trucking companies have about 20% spare capacity in their networks. So the removal of yellow would not impact the economy. It would actually be a boon across, across the board for the remaining carriers. That is good news that in terms of the trucking sector, time is on our side. So Don, do you have any other news for us? Yes, uh, so some other news. Uh, there seems to be another blow to the real estate market. Following the recent U.S. debt downgrade, mortgage rates have ticked upward. According to Bankrate, 30-year mortgage rates topped over 7% last week. This is the highest in three weeks. And the number is climbing even further. This means consumers will have to pay more for the same home. Now, some more news in the food industry. Hard times hit a major U.S. meat producer. Tyson Foods announced yesterday that it would close four chicken plants, uh, two in Missouri, one in Indiana, and another in Arkansas. Tyson said it doesn't make as much, uh, as much money from chicken sales. The company reported a 3.5% drop in revenue in the second quarter. Um, this is compared to the same period last year. This is despite selling more chicken. Now, staying with food, pasta sauce brand Rouse has changed hands. Chicken noodle soup king Campbell just spent $2.7 billion to buy its maker, Sauvels Brands. The company has grown rapidly over the past few years. Campbell said the purchase would boost its offerings in the meals and beverages category. Sauvels also called the deal a momentous occasion, adding it would continue to bring products to more households. And finally, just a quick update on X, the company formerly known as Twitter. It got a $5,000 fine last month. That's after putting up a new sign at its San Francisco headquarters without a permit. Now, 
According to the San Francisco Department of Building Inspection, the city received two dozen complaints about the sign. And it involves uh, concerns involving structural safety and the bright flashing lights. And that's all from me. Back to you, Kevin. Well, in terms of X, you got to make sure you have the right computer code and that you follow the city's code. Thank you so much, Don, host of NTD Business, for your reports. Thank you. Negotiations have broken down between local unions and the city of Los Angeles. More than 11,000 city workers are expected to walk off the job today. Joining other unions in the region, city workers have said they will shut down the city for 24 hours. The SEIU Local 721 represents about 95,000 union workers in Southern California, making it the largest in the region. It's the first strike of its kind in about 40 years. The union says the city has flat out refused to honor previous agreements at the bargaining table and that it prompted workers to file unfair labor practice charges. The union wrote, we're striking for respect, plain and simple. And if we don't get it, we'll shut it down. Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass reassured residents that the city will not shut down due to the strike in a statement issued yesterday. She also said the city was available to make progress 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Still to come, does birth control put you in a bad mood? We spoke to an expert about the effects it can have. Get that story in just a minute. My dad's name was David. He always talked about getting life insurance, and now it's too late. No one was expecting my husband, Dave, to suffer from a heart attack. We didn't have life insurance. We thought we had more time. Don't be Dave, and don't wait until it's too late to get the life insurance coverage you need. And if you don't have enough insurance to cover funeral costs, credit card debt, and other expenses, your family is going to get stuck with the bill. Call now to get affordable life insurance. Just call. 800-494-1562. If you're over 50, you can't be turned down for this insurance, regardless of your health. Plus, there's no medical exam, no health questions. Your rate will never go up. Your coverage will never go down. And rates start as low as $5 a week. Remember, don't be Dave. Call now. Call now. 800-494-1562. According to Marx, everything must be seen through the lens of oppressor and oppressed. Our property rights have continued to get weaker. The threat of these takings is no longer just for public use, but also for better use. This means that the government can force the exchange of property from one private citizen to another private citizen. This is nowhere near the Founding Fathers' intentions. We now have a record share of Americans that have never been married, I being one of them. In fact, the median age of a first marriage has never been higher. Now, you may be thinking this is only affecting single adults. Well, not exactly. According to Pew Research, one in four parents living with their child are unmarried. And let's take a look at how many children are currently living with either one parent or no parent. This is my country, Myanmar. Anti-drug movement. Welcome back. Dropping birth control might help you fix your depression or bad mood. Research has recently found a correlation and I spoke to a doctor to find out more. 
Joining me now is Dr. Shannon Crawford to tell us more. She's a psychologist and CEO of Crawford Clinics. Good morning, doctor. Can you start by telling me what the study found about birth control pills and uh, stress regulation? Absolutely. There's prolific research coming out that there are correlations. We can't say causation because research can only look for correlation, that there are impacts with women, cognitive ability, and the experience of stress coming down through social relationships. Some of our biology that's wired to protect us, it's not having the appropriate response while women are on a biological um, hormone replacing type uh, birth control. So it's interesting to look at those correlations and compare that with patients that we're seeing in our offices. Now, what exactly was found, to what extent does it impact a woman's stress regulation capability? And by that I mean, will it really significantly affect quality of life? Well, first of all, every pill, every medication, everyone is different. There's different uh, profile of what hormones are being adjusted, and then every woman's body going into using the medication. So some women have a positive experience, some have a neutral, and some have a really negative experience. And so that's where we really need to educate the population that hormones are directly impacting our depression rates, our suicide rates, cognitive abilities, and ability to engage in relationships and have a reduced stress response. Now that's not everybody, but that can be a factor that we need to let people know. Below the age of 20, there's a much higher risk. Some studies are saying anywhere from three to six percent increase in suicidal thoughts and depression, depression feelings because the brain is driven by hormones. So development during that window is very critical. And a lot of women are sharing that the early depression experience, it's like their body attunes to that during hormone adjustment, right? So in those early below 20, when a lot of girls get uh, prescribed 15 to 16, that's when the brain is very critical in its development, which is driven by hormone, right? So those hormones are now being affected by an artificial source. Mm -hmm. So we need more longitudinal studies of how does that impact future mood in adulthood. Mm, understood. Now, if there are women watching right now that are on uh, birth control and mm -hmm. they would like to decrease their stress levels, how would you recommend they do that? Well, there's practical things we can do. So we were talking this morning about journaling and exercising and being in healthy relationships. Faith and spirituality are all buffers that can help with stress and anxiety. But also knowing that you can use contraceptives that don't have to be a birth control, a hormone replacement type of strategy. There's lots of other ones out there. Um, I wrote natural cycles is one that's now FDA approved and that's using your body's own rhythm and recognizing that. So there's a lot of approaches, but one knowing if you're starting to find yourself more irritable, anxious, uh, depressed, suicidal thoughts, any of those kinds of reactions in weight gain, uh, cognitive, like almost like a fog, a lot of women have described, then you know maybe this isn't the right fit for you and you should get an evaluation. And again, we're not trained, right? Even in psychology training, they don't help, they don't say, hey, ask about their birth control pills. That's something that even just meeting with women over time going, oh my gosh, this is such a theme, especially for adolescent girls with higher anxiety rates, um, irritability, all the mood disjointed. And we take things as, oh, that's just development, when really you're introducing synthetic hormones into the developing brain, and that's going to cause affecting emotions and personality and all of those things. Thank you so much for pointing that out. And I think you made a very good point with that this is something that might be overlooked often. So thank yes. you so much, Dr. Shannon Crawford. I really appreciate your insights. You're welcome. A firefighter dive team in Boise, Idaho, came to one man's rescue yesterday. But not in a way that you might expect. Yeah, when a man was out on a pond in his boat, he dropped his expensive hearing aid into the water. The Boise Dive Rescue Team just happened to be there doing some training. The man identified as Mark on Facebook asked the team to help him locate the hearing aid. Fortunately, Captain Yates found it within five minutes. Talk about being in the right place at the right time, huh? Yeah, absolutely. And is this story going to coin a new phrase? It's no longer a needle in the haystack, but a hearing aid in, in a pond. <laughs> I want to see that happen. <laughs> all right, that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear from you at goodmorning at ntd.com. Write us if you like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.